Welcome to the book launch uh, of Simon Mai's book, Engaging the Evil Empire, Washington, Moscow, and the Beginning of the End of the Cold War. Uh, we are delighted that Professor Imboden has accepted our invitation to uh, introduce Simon and uh, to lead the discussion. Uh, so Professor, si uh, Professor Imboden will uh, introduce formally Simon. And um, I would like just to say a couple of words. First of all, thank you, uh, all the attendees, for being here. Uh, thank you to Cornell University Press. And thank you to the Duke Center for International Global Studies, Rethinking, Development Prog Rethinking Diplomacy Program, for uh, having organized this event together with the American Grand Strategies Program and the Sanford School of Public Pol Policy. Uh, I would like just to say that Professor William Imboden is the Executive Director and William Powers Junior Chair at the Clements Center for National Security at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, he uh, uh, has a distinguished career uh, both as a scholar and also in uh, uh, various branches and departments of the U.S. government. His current research is on the Reagan administration's national security strategy and policy. So I cannot think of a um, better scholar slash um, policy maker to introduce Simon uh, Myers and uh, his book today. Thank you very much for being here and uh, all questions uh, and uh, remarks and comments should be sent through the chat room and Professor Imboden will lead the discussion uh, based also on your inputs. Thank you very much, Professor Imboden. Thank you very much, Giovanni, and uh, welcome, welcome to all of, all of our guests. Um, this is a uh, particularly exciting and gratifying for me to be uh, able to uh, be leading this discussion with, with Simon, not just because this is a, an incredible book, and let me hold it up and encourage all of you to, to buy your own copies. Don't wait for it to show up at the library, available for at an affordable price on Amazon. Um, but uh, as some of you know, I had the opportunity, the honor really of being present at the creation for a lot of this, since I was one of uh, Simon's dissertation committee members uh, during his graduate study here at the University of Texas at Austin, and where the early seeds of what became this book were developed first as his dis, uh, dissertation and now this book. And so it's um, for those uh, of our more seasoned guests of my generation or older who have had the privilege of seeing your uh, former students uh, uh, publish really path-breaking research like this, you know uh, how especially gratifying it is. Um, before we turn it over to Simon to make a few opening comments on his book, and then I will do the discussion and we'll take audience questions questions. Um, I want to give our, uh, uh, our listeners, our viewers, a uh, little bit uh, of, of context for how important this book is. Um, uh, I think that we are at the, the dawn of what is becoming or what will become a golden era in scholarship on the Reagan administration and 1980s international politics and geopolitics and, and the end, end of the Cold War. Uh, and there's been some very good work done previously on this, but the reason why this particular moment we're in is so exciting is, is threefold. Um, first, over the last 10 years, there's been a massive wave of declassification of a lot of Reagan and other you know, key government uh, national security documents from the 1980s. And so scholars now can view a lot of archival documents and evidence that just wasn't available you know, uh, 10 years ago or sometimes even, even, even five years ago. Uh, so for any um, aspiring or early on PhD students and audience, Thinking about dissertation uh, subjects, um, there's some uh, almost endless fertile archival material to be mining uh, on the on this on this era. The second is uh, what I would call a diminished partisanship. Now, our current moment, of course, is you got very partisan politics, but. Uh, the 1980s also had deep partisan divisions. Um, Reagan and the Reagan administration inspired very strong uh, feelings and reactions among his supporters and his critics. And that's not always necessarily a bad thing, but strong partisan fevers can sometimes cloud clear analysis. And I'm especially excited to see a younger generation of scholars exemplified by Simon, his real leader here, who uh, came of age after the Reagan years and who had not been affected one way or another pro or con by a lot of that partisanship. And that, of course, um, uh, equips them to take a more you know, dispassionate, objective, balanced view uh, or assessment or reassessment of the policies of that era. And the third factor in some ways follows from the second. This is what we might call the passage of geopolitical time. Um, 
we are now some three decades past the, the peaceful end of, end of the Cold War. We know how history has played out since then. Uh, and that in turn is a great boon for the historian's perspective. Now that we know how the story ended, how things have played, played out since, that we can go back now and revisit the early and mid 1980s uh, and discern more clearly what was significant and what was perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, per peripheral in ways that may not have been so evident in the, in the headlines at the time. Um, and so turning to the, this book, Engaging the Evil Empire, Washington, Moscow, and the beginning of the end of the Cold War. Um, the only reference I want to make to my own work is this. Uh, I'm currently, as Giovanni mentioned, uh, uh, pretty far along in writing my own history of Reagan administration national security policy. And over the course of that research, I've read several hundred books on the Reagan administration, Reagan administration foreign policy. This book is among the four or five very finest available. Um, this book sets a new standard for a fresh, balanced, insightful take, uh, especially on those critical years of 1980 to 1985. And while there's a, recently been some very good work uh, produced on the Reagan-Gorbachev relationship, the Reagan second term, kind of 1985 onwards, um, a criticism of some of those works, rightfully, is that they seem to start in a vacuum. Uh, Gorbachev just appears, and then you've got this Reagan-Gorbachev partnership. What happened before that? Where did that come from? Well, as Simon's book shows, uh, that didn't arise in, in a vacuum, but there are some very important uh, developments um, uh, in, the, in the first Reagan term and during, uh, particularly during the Andropov and Chernyenko time. Uh, and so uh, his book is uh, understanding what happened up until the rise of Gorbachev is essential to understanding uh, Gorb uh, the Reagan-Gorbachev uh, Gorbachev partnership. And so this book really is a lodestar and a model of international history. Um, before I get to some of my questions for Simon, Simon, let's go ahead and turn it over to you uh, to give us a little bit of a framing on um, uh, how you put this project together and what some of those important, important themes are. So over to you. Thanks so much, Will, and, uh, and thank you uh, for doing this. It's a real treat to be able to do this together. And uh, my, my, my gratitude to Giovanni and Ping at, at the Duke Center for International and Global Studies, uh, as well as to everyone at the American Grand Strategy Program uh, for making this, this uh, wonderful event happy, happen. It's, it's really nice to be here with you on what is the official uh, launch date of the book, although it is my understanding uh, that Amazon had very different views on when the book came out uh, than I was given to understand, but that's a, a happy accident. Jeff, Jeff um, Bezos strikes again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, this, this book really came out of a puzzle uh, for me, and you, you elucidated uh, half of that puzzle. Uh, how do we get from the so-called death of detente, right? The Soviet invasion of Afghanistan being probably the hallmark of that, but also the ratcheting up of human rights rhetoric by the Carter administration in the late 70s, uh, increased American defense spending in the late 70s, uh, increasing tensions uh, precipitated by a lot of human rights organizations in Eastern Europe in particular. How do we get from the end of detente to kind of one of the textbook cases of old rivals putting aside their differences and finding grounds for cooperation, right? Reagan and Gorbachev, or as Reagan called him, Gorby, uh, and Reagan refers to him as such in his, in his diary, you know, Reagan and Gorby kind of palling around uh, on, on Red Square the signature image and images of the end of the Cold War. And that process too is, is a really fast process, mm -hmm. right? One moment, the Cold War is very much there and is kind of this sort of Damocles over international society. And then very quickly, it's not. And, and I think we're still trying to work through how such a massive transformation could happen a transformation of the international system, which theretofore had only been brought about by great power war, right? By horrible violence. In this case, happened largely peaceful and if, peacefully. And of course, there are there are uh, episodes of, of, of violence in that process, but still, the scale is quite remarkable uh, to me. And and my kind of sense of confusion at this uh, at this this change was compounded by by two things. Uh, it was first that this was allegedly the second Cold War. 
right? That's the shorthand term for kind of 80 to 85. It's the second Cold War. Nothing's happening. Uh, and then all of a sudden, huge things are happening at Geneva, at Reykjavik, uh, et cetera. And then there's this image of nothing could happen because in the Soviet Union, all you had were a collection of leaders who were varying degrees of physically incapacitated, uh, unwilling to, to work with the United States. Um, so that makes it even, makes it even, make even less sense uh, to me. And something had to have happened, it seemed to me. Something had to have happened during those intervening five years that could bridge uh, those two pretty starkly contrasting periods, uh, but which isn't a part of the so-called conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. So I went looking. Uh, I, I, went, I went hunting uh, in, in, a, in a few archives. Uh, a lot of American and, and Soviet, now Russian uh, archives, but a lot of other archives too around Eastern Europe uh, and elsewhere. And we can, we can talk more about that if, if you want to talk about the, the methodology. Um, and I found three things. There, there are three major kind of arguments to this book. The first is that the key to understanding the speed and the scope of the changes at the end of the 1980s lies in the beginning of that decade. Uh, so this book is very intentionally about 1980 to 1985. Um, I, I didn't run out of word count. Um, the, the kind people at Cornell would have probably let me keep going. Uh, this book is very intentionally about those first five often overlooked uh, years. And, and the reason for that is because the Cold War balance of power goes from one perceived to favor the Soviet Union, uh, and I emphasize the word perceived, in 1980 to one favoring the United States. Mm -hmm. And also that the superpower relationship goes from a war of words, uh, that's of course where the evil empire line comes from in the title, um, but also back channel dialogue, very much not something that's part of our, our, our mainstream understanding of this period, to the overt dialogue, the summits, and the summits which are bearing fruit, for example, in 1987 when the INF Treaty is signed. Mm. The second big uh, finding of the book uh, is that Ronald Reagan uh, implemented a fairly consistent uh, dual track, track approach to the Soviet Union, a dual track grand strategy, if you will, which shaped both of those processes I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and the two tracks are, to, to be very brief, on the one hand, the conventional Reagan. That's what he called peace through strength. Mm -hmm. The arms build up, uh, the ideological offensive, uh, and the work to build up America's alliance relationships, especially NATO. And the other is a lesser known Reagan, but it's actually a Reagan that you find a lot in Reagan's own writing about himself. And that's what I call and he called quiet diplomacy, mm -hmm. secret back channel negotiations, in particular with the Soviet Union, designed not only to prevent tensions from boiling over, but also to generate diplomatic momentum, the diplomatic momentum on which uh, the United States would capitalize in particular during the Gorbachev years, but that was built during the years of Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernyenko. And then finally, uh, I found that the Soviet Union actually has a strategy, mm -hmm. right? And, and as uh, someone who in large sense considers himself in equal parts a historian of the United States as well as of the Soviet Union, uh, this was really important to me to highlight. Uh, that Moscow is not a passive actor. Uh, the Kremlin is actually capable of agency, right? It wasn't all just the Ronald Reagan uh, show. And, and that approach echoes a lot of the core of Soviet uh, military doctrine, actually, and still Russian military doctrine together today, which was using space to buy time. Or in this context, reducing tensions to create some breathing space so that the Soviet Union could deal with its very serious, uh, increasingly dire domestic economic and political problems without having the additional burden of uh, Cold War, of acute Cold War competition. So that's present over all four years. It's not this image of 
uh, or I don't, I try not to present an image of stagnation or the common term of interregnum. Uh, rather, I try to play out this dynamic interchange between Washington and Moscow at the, uh, at the period, which I argue is the beginning of the end of the, of the Cold War. No, a, a wonderful overview, and I hope that lets the appetite of our you know, listeners and viewers to you know pick up the book themselves and explore it more in depth. Um, I want to follow up on a number of the different um, themes and threads that you you put out there, uh, and we're also going to come back to some of the um, research method questions. But first, one of the big thematic ones: uh, structure versus agency. You know, uh, as as you know, the, these are some of the big debates about how and why the Cold War ended the way it did. Uh, you know, how much of it was just a function of the structures of the international system, um, some of the, you know, decaying bipolarity, uh, the American economic resurgence, uh, some of the, uh, you know, sort of internal decline and rot within the Soviet Union. And those who focus more on agency will say, okay, well, that may have been going on, but the choices that individual leaders make, the individual leaders themselves, those really matter. Uh, and it was not inevitable that it was going to come out this way. Um, Tell us more about uh, the insights that your book and your research shed on this structure versus agency debate about what really matters in international politics, especially what matters in the Cold War ending the way it did. So uh, one of my one of my favorite things about being here at, at Duke in the Stanford School is being in an, in an interdisciplinary department. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I get to work with a lot of really wonderful social scientists. Uh, and I think it always uh, kind of frustrates my colleagues uh, from from with a social science background when I say, mm -hmm. why not both? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I found in this in this research and, and, and also in, in other work um, is that different people respond to similar circumstances differently, right? Uh, so structure matters because it shapes the context, uh, but also the individual agency of key actors also really matters because they take that information, they orient themselves, and then they take action. Uh, and that's shaped by their own personalities, that's shaped by their own personal histories, and of course it's shaped by their context. So Gorbachev is a great example here, you know, where it's not inevitable that he makes the choices that he makes beginning in 1985 um, to very deliberately try to score diplomatic wins uh, in the form of just doing diplomacy uh, with the United States in order to, one, solidify his own position which is a lot more precarious for the entire period than I think a lot of us uh, really give, uh, give credit to, of course, exemplified by the 91 coup attempt, but it's, it's, it's <clears throat> done pretty thin ice pretty quickly. Um, he could have made very different choices faced with the same circumstances. Uh, he could have made the choices, for example, of his mentor, Yuri Andropov, mm -hmm. who starts going down that road, but still also puts a lot more focus on sort of state controlled heavy industry, uh, various economic choices, which Gorbachev issues in favor of kind of market liberalization reforms. Mm -hmm. And he could have tried to implement those market liberalization reforms without the uh, perestroika, right? Without the attendant political reforms, glasnost. Um, that didn't have to happen. It was made much more likely to happen by the realities in the Soviet Union at the time. It was made even more likely to happen because Gorbachev at this time had a much better understanding of what the actual circumstances were in the Soviet Union. There's a lot of Politburo members are being lied to, uh, mm -hmm. to make a very long story short about just how dire the circumstances are. Yeah. Um, and thus, when I look at this structure versus agency debate, uh, I, I really do see this as a false binary um, because people are shaped by events around them, circumstances around them, but people are also able to shape uh, those circumstances. And I think what we see in this case uh, is both, mm -hmm. is, is, is leaders taking action based on what they see, uh, and that's Reagan, that's the story of Reagan, I think, his perception mm -hmm. of American weakness, Mm -hmm. uh, but also his response to that was different to Jimmy Carter's, mm -hmm. for example. It was a Reagan uh, response. Yeah. 
Well, and I, I want to come back to the uh, the Reagan response and policies in, in a little bit. But before that, um, let's follow up on this um, structure agency question with a uh, Two related counterfactuals, which I know you've given given a lot of thought to, and you, you touched on these, but I want to give you a chance to elaborate. Um, so as a thought experiment, let's say that um, Andropov and or Chernyenko had eaten more of their vegetables when they were younger and taken more vitamins and maybe didn't down as much vodka. You know, there was going, let's say either of them had lived longer, had been able to stay in office for a year or two longer. Um, or, or even, you know, throughout the duration of Reagan's presidency. I mean, you know, if they had the longevity of a, of a Brezhnev, for example. Um, uh, how might things have played out, played out differently? I think that uh, on the one hand, they both wanted, uh, and they were very vocal about this, uh, they both wanted more overt diplomatic engagement with the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, Chernyenko in particular uh, gets really frustrated that he can't make this happen, in part because of his very serious health problems, yeah. uh, and also in part because the Reagan administration is still hesitant to go that far. Mm -hmm. Take that and amplify that by a factor of 10, and that's Andropov, mm -hmm. who, because he had been head of the KGB before, uh, before becoming uh, the general secretary in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. had a really good understanding, probably the best understanding on coming into office of any Soviet leader of this of this era of just the nature of the Soviet Union's problems, right? Because Andropov got the raw intelligence. Mm -hmm. And then he and, and his team kind of edited it for the for the consumption of others. But he's getting information like massive scale of defections. Mm -hmm. You know, just every day, not the famous, you know, double agents, not Oleg Gordievsky or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Just every day kind of low ranking KGB folks who get posted to Spain and stop showing up to work. Mm. He knows that it's, it's an economic problem, but it's a political problem. And I think he really wants to ameliorate that, but he doesn't have the open mindedness, I, I guess I would say of a Gorbachev. Um, Gorbachev is willing and open to, to new ideas uh, he had been one of Andropov's key uh, key kind of mentees, I guess we could say, uh, but he has an openness to new ideas, which Andropov doesn't have. I think that comes in large part to do with age. Uh, you know, Gorbachev's first job, right? His first job out of university is to travel the countryside and his, his the South Caucasus around Stavropol uh, and explain Khrushchev's secret speech on the Stalin cult to the public. That's his political initiation, right? Uh, that's quite something. That sets yeah. a real tenor. Yeah. Um, and also, he has around him some really free thinking advisors, mm -hmm. uh, some of whom have paid professionally uh, Alexander Yakovlev gets effectively exiled uh, to be ambassador to Canada, which, you know, of course, I think is a, a really plumb position. Uh, I'm very biased on this. As matter. a good Canadian, yeah. Um, I had to get that shout out there, right? Okay. Um, he effectively gets exiled for, for holding some of these views. Gorbachev brings him in. Mm -hmm. and, and he's willing to because he has a sense of security that I think no one in the Soviet Union who lived through, in particular, the dawn of World War II in, on Soviet territory, right? The beginning of Operation Barbarossa leaves a really indelible mark. And they write about this, about never wanting to be caught flat-footed and surprised again. Gorbachev's policies perhaps invite some of that to a much greater extent than I think any Soviet leader would have been. So similar thrust, but I think a lot of the specifics, you would look at very different approaches. Okay. Well, I want to um, now switch gears and look a little bit more at Ronald Reagan um, and um, and pick up on you had earlier mentioned a big part of your argument is what you see as a certain consistency in Reagan's dual track strategy of pressure and engagement or pressure and, and outreach. Um, uh, and of course, as you as you know very well, there are um, you know, endless and ongoing and very interesting debates about did Reagan have a consistent strategy? Was there a quote unquote Reagan reversal where he's the hardliner up through 1983 and then the more accommodationist afterwards? Um, or as our mutual friend and a fantastic scholar, James Grant Wilson has argued, was there more improvisation 
than a big grand strategic vision. Um, uh, so a two-part question. First, tell us a little bit more about where you situate yourself in these debates about, you know, was Reagan consistent or, or, uh, or changing course? And then second, um, any broader takeaways from your book, especially since uh, you teach at a policy school, our audience is interested in, in policy and strategy. Any takeaways from your book uh, for thinking about uh, grand strategy uh, as a principle? So this is, this is a, a question that I often think about because I teach strategy, uh, yeah. right? I can, I can see some of my, my students from the American Grand Strategy course uh, here with us now. Give, and, give them some extra credit. So be a <laughs> yes, I, I know who is here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, don't, I don't view um, evolution as necessarily meaning that there is no plan. Right. And, and strategy to me, especially grand strategy, when you're really talking about all levels of national power, uh, must be responsive to changing realities, or at least in order to be good, it needs, I think it needs to be responsive to changing realities. Um, and it also needs to contain various tools. Right. It, a strategy, you know, I had a piece in foreign policy a while ago, for example, about Iran, uh, where I argued that a policy of just sort of beating the Iranians uh, over the head with, with harsh rhetoric isn't really gonna do anything. Mm. Might, might score you some political points, but it's not really gonna affect the kind of change that, that I think a lot of people want to. Mm. Reagan, I think, understood this. And so I fall much more in the, in the consistency camp, not to say that he basically wrote a plan and then never deviated, but rather in my research, I came, I, I did a lot of reading of Reagan's earlier works. Mm -hmm. um, especially pre-presidential mm -hmm. uh, work. And, and uh, you know, even when he was president of the Screen, Screen Actors Guild, he had to do Back a lot in of- the 40s and 50s, yeah. Yes, a long time ago, but he had to do a lot of negotiating. And when he was GE, General Electric's kind of spokesman at large, mm -hmm. um, he ruminates a lot on carrots and sticks. Mm -hmm. And that's how I make sense of, 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 of American strategy under Reagan towards the Soviet Union is it's one of carrots and sticks. Mm -hmm. So you have the massive defense buildup. You have the, the really harsh ideological rhetoric, though I, I, I would emphasize that the Soviets gave as good as they got on that, on yeah, that front, yeah. um, including you know, frequent comparisons of the president to Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Uh, in the press. Which they didn't mean as a compliment. <laughs> yes, yeah. which, which, which was not meant as a compliment. Yeah. Um, so that's the, that's the stick part, right? Yeah. But then you go to the negotiating table, mm -hmm. whether that negotiating table is a back room in an embassy in Berlin that no one really knows anything is happening at, or whether that's the Geneva summit and, you know, the Aga Khan's uh, lakefront villa in uh, much more sumptuous surroundings, yeah. when you go to the negotiating table, you actually have something you can trade. Yeah. But you've also established the idea in your interlocutors that you're actually willing to trade, mm. right? So it's not seen as just a rhetorical exercise, just a point scoring exercise. I think this is the big takeaway from, for, from Reagan's strategy today, mm -hmm. um, is that as it was conceived of then, one, it was responsive to changing realities or cha and changing perspectives. That's why there's a lot less of the ideological stuff near the end and a lot more of the overt engagement. Mm -hmm. But it also backed diplomacy with force and power and credibility. Both the credibility that you were a good faith interlocutor, mm -hmm. but also that you would abandon the effort if it wasn't working out, and also that you didn't rely on diplomacy mm -hmm. in order to kind of keep your head above the water. That's Gorbachev's problem, especially at the end, mm -hmm. is that diplomacy is kind of all he's got uh, at home and abroad. And so he needs to make some pretty striking concessions. Yeah. So, um, no, uh, no, I, yeah, very, very helpful. And that's why I, I think, you know, you've really benefited from some of the more recently declassified uh, Reagan administration documents as well. And I think that said, you know, certainly reinforces a, a lot of the findings I've had too. Um, let's talk about a couple of other important uh, people and episodes from this time. Um, and even though over the course of your book, you're working with three different Soviet leaders, Brezhnev and Drapo Chernyenko, 
There's also a another important Soviet who transcends those three, and that's Foreign Minister Gromyko. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you learned about Gromyko, um, what role he plays in your in your in your arguments. Um, uh, uh, any ways that maybe your assessments of him changed over the course of your research? So Gromyka is is often referred to, uh, I guess I wouldn't say affectionately, uh, as Mr. Nyet. Yeah. Right. That, that that's all he did uh, was 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 say no, um, and he certainly is emblematic of what's referred to as the gerontocracy in the Kremlin. Right. It's the early '80s. He's been in his job since the 1950s. Yeah. And there's no arguing. The Soviet uh, version of a tenured professor, right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no arguing with that fact. Yeah. Um, but at the same time. I found that he was a, uh, a much more active and engaged participant in a lot of these processes than we think of. Mm -hmm. You know, on the one hand, Gorbachev removes him from his post mm -hmm. with, the, with a promotion, a nominal promotion, it's, it's a de jure promotion, it's not really a de facto promotion, mm -hmm. to be the head of the Supreme Soviet, which is allegedly the highest decision-making body in the Soviet Union, but is actually uh, a very uh, a gilded uh, a rubber stamp. Mm -hmm. um, so Gorbachev feels that he needs to get Gromyko out. So in a sense, Gorbachev kind of misjudges him in a, in a similar, same way as I had. But when I look through his role in some of the earlier negotiation, um, he seems to be a lot more of a constructive player mm -hmm. uh, throughout a lot of this. I think in part because he recognizes the problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but that constructiveness was modulated by bureaucratic infighting. Mm -hmm. So he's often not constructive, not because he's not even on the record as endorsing this, but rather because it's part of a Kremlin power play. Uh, and you know, one of the things that I, I really love being able to show in this book is that there are of course vivid stories about the bureaucratic infighting uh, in the Reagan administration, as there yeah. are in, you know, basically every American administration. Yeah, but, you know, Weinberger versus Schultz, yeah, you know, yeah, you get everybody, classic, yeah. <laughs> classic fights. It was really fun, including a lot, using uh, Gromyka to illustrate just how that's playing out in the Kremlin, too, that this is not a black box, this isn't a monolith, this is uh, an area where people are really having heated fights over policy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, and speaking of fights over policy, um, let's shift now and talk about your uh, your findings um, and where the role of SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, fits into fits into your argument. And um, uh, of course, as hopefully at least you know, some of our listeners and viewers know, SDI becomes very important in the Reagan Gorbachev relationship, and it's kind of the main sticking point that uh, you know stops them from sort of the final grand bargain at Reykjavik in, in '86. But um, as you certainly show in here, pretty early on, certainly in 1984, the Soviets are already worried about SDI. No one quite knows if this thing could actually be real or not, but the mere notion of it um, is is certainly at least getting the, the Kremlin's attention somewhat. So tell us a little bit more about um, your, your findings on SDI and the role that it plays in these years up until Gorbachev. So SDI is, you know, just from a policy perspective, is fascinating because of how few of the very top leadership in the Reagan White House knows about it mm -hmm. before it's unveiled by the president on TV. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Including, for example, you mentioned uh, George Shultz, yeah. uh, who basically finds out about this at the same time as everyone mm -hmm. uh, does. SDI is, of course, this sort of fantastic sci-fi uh, anti-ballistic missile defense system, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brilliant pebbles and space-based lasers. I mean, it, it earns it earns its moniker of Star Wars justly, yeah. right? Um, but as it was perceived in the Soviet Union, uh, this was kind of the apex of the leveraging of American technological know-how and economic power in order to undermine something that the Soviet Union did have an undeniable advantage in, which was kind of mass. Yeah. Right? Uh, this, is, this is the era of kind of throw weight, uh, which is a 
kind of the actuarial sort of term for how many missiles a side could get into the air or into space. Uh, and the Soviet Union has an advantage in that. And it's a hard won advantage. Um, this seemed to Soviet policymakers that it could wipe out those capabilities, not necessarily overnight, but really put them into jeopardy. And when we talk about this capability to kind of uh, absorb a Soviet attack, whether that's retaliatory or a preemptive strike, uh, of course, they, they mostly thought about it in the context of retaliatory. Um, it has to be mentioned in the context of all of the other things the Reagan administration is doing. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have an administration which is building highly miniaturized, highly accurate nuclear weapons in the MX missile, the Trident D5 submarine launched missile that's building a stealth bomber, which can maybe deliver uh, nuclear payloads uh, undetected uh, in, a, in a decapitation uh, strike that's fielding. Uh, new, more capable nuclear, intermediate range nuclear weapons in Western Europe, which uh, don't extend all the way to Moscow, but, but have all of Eastern Europe in, its, in, their, in their range. Um, and then it's talking about fielding something that can prevent Soviet retaliation, totally undoing mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot like a plan to fight a nuclear war. Yeah, it looks a lot like a plan to fight a nuclear war. And then you have Reagan's rhetoric. Then you have some unfortunate hot mic incidents uh, about, you know, we'll start the bombing in five minutes, which you know, no one in Moscow takes seriously. So SCI creates a lot of a strain on the Soviet leadership, in part because they know that they don't have it in them to match this capability mm -hmm. economically. And also there are serious technological problems. Um, you know, there's not a lot of liquid cash sitting around, especially not uh, foreign currency, which would be needed to get some of the, the equipment that, to make something like this happen. Yeah. So they then either have to kind of compete in this really quixotic way, or they need to concede defeat. And neither of those is exactly appealing uh, to Soviet policymakers. So I know some people, you know, some people, I think it's, it's possible to overstate the importance uh, of SDI. But situated in the context of everything else that the administration is doing, and it's one more really powerful pressure point. And of course, Reagan says, well, we'll share it with you. Um, and, and I think he was actually quite sincere on this. I think he, was, he sincerely wanted to rid the world of, of nuclear weapons. But why on earth would any Soviet leader believe him? You know, I, th I think... Uh, I think it's Shevardnadze, or maybe it's Gorbachev himself. Shevardnadze is Gorbachev's foreign minister after Gromyko's uh, removed. Um, he says, you won't set, share milking technology with us. Why on earth would we believe that you'll share the technology to shoot down ballistic missiles? It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a really important point of, I think, strain and leverage that the United States has. And because it's not really anything yet, it's a great bargaining chip, right? If we, if we want to kind of keep the chip metaphor going, it doesn't have a dollar value written on it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're kind of both guessing and playing this game about what its value uh, is. Uh, and that, that turned out to be a winning proposition for the United States. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, another question, uh, and this is going to be following up on that theme about Soviet fears of, uh, you know, an American, an American first strike and Soviet uh, vulnerabilities. By the way, let me say to our, our viewers and listeners, um, if you do have any questions, we're going to be turning to those in a minute. So please do feel free to type any of those into the, into the chat room. Um, but uh, Simon, let's focus on a very particular episode in your book, the Abel Archer crisis. Um, and um, for our, our listeners, um, I'll let Simon, before you explain your findings on that, give them a quick little background on what it actually was. Um, but I, you know, going back to the significance of your book, uh, you are the first or certainly one of the very first scholars to have a pretty strongly revisionist take on what actually happened or didn't happen with Abel Archer and, and how much it, it mattered or not. And, um, you know, for that reason alone, because it's become so iconic, you know, two books just on the Abel Archer crisis came out in the last year that were, that were bestsellers. And you've, you, you've got a pretty different take. So please tell us what it was and then tell us um, how your, your, your archival discoveries may differ from what a lot of the conventional wisdom was. 
Gladly. So the, the conventional story about Able Archer is that it's when the so-called Second Cold War almost turned hot. Uh, November 1983, NATO is running a command post exercise, kind of rehearsing the motions of starting a nuclear war, uh, using intermediate range nuclear weapons to repel a Soviet attack through the famous Fulda Gap. So the, the conventional story is that the Soviets watched this happen uh, and persuaded themselves that this was actually cover, that this exercise was cover for a nuclear surprise attack. That you know, when the allegedly fake big red button was pushed, it would actually be the real thing. Uh, and key to this story is actually a fellow I mentioned earlier, which is or, who's Oleg Gordievsky, who was a, a KGB officer stationed in the Soviet embassy in London, uh, who kind of breaks this uh, this story. It's a great story. He, he, he breaks it in terms of uh, sharing. In terms of he reveals it to the British. He reveals yeah, it yeah, to his so British handlers. Yeah, and then they say, oh, my gosh, we, we kind of we almost we got to the, the within a, a breath of, of nuclear war as the Soviets contemplated a preemptive strike. Mm -hmm. It's a great Cold War story, right? Spies, you know, missiles in dark German forests. <clears throat> There's a whole element that has to do with supercomputers and cybernetics, which uh, I, we probably don't have time to get into now, but which is which is a lot of fun. Um, what I found, uh, and mostly in, in my research for this book, primarily in the East German and the Czechoslovak uh, military and intelligence archives uh, in, in Freiburg and Berlin and Prague, uh, was a very different story. Um, what I found, and, and I, should, I should mention that these two uh, countries, intelligence agencies, the Stasi and the STB uh, in East Germany and Czechoslovakia, respectively, were actually the lead monitors of what was going on. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I find, by contrast, a very sanguine approach to, to what's going on. In fact, a lot of comments from very senior intelligence officials saying, we know this is just an exercise. We know that they're just going through the motions. This is all framed in, in much more ideological language, but, but it's, it's pretty straightforward what they're saying in, in Prague and East Berlin and what they're reporting uh, to, to Moscow. Mm -hmm. And that really struck me because I started this project an Able Archer kind of believer. Right? Yeah. What I was really excited to do was to explain how it could get this bad, and yet they still got over it. That they went. So at first I was a little bit let down, but then I was really excited because to me it showed the promise and the real uh, wealth of information in these archives. Then I started chasing this question down in Moscow, in Kiev, in some really wonderful uh, interviews and oral histories conducted with very senior military policymakers. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that while there was some pretty routine Soviet, I guess we could call it counter mobilization, mm -hmm. and this is normal during large scale military exercises, just yeah. to show the other side, you know, we're watching, we're aware. Mm -hmm. um, all of these top Soviet policymakers are very derisive of the idea that things ever came to the, to the brink of nuclear war. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, they're saying, you know, no, we knew this was just another exercise uh, and we responded accordingly, uh, but we didn't really take seriously any of these uh, any of these ideas that there was a real threat of nuclear war. So a very different story to the one that's that's conventionally told. Uh, in some ways, it's uh, maybe not as good a story. It doesn't have the the emotional uh, charge that you know maybe anyone uh, listening or watching has has seen the show Deutschland '83, which is kind of all about this. Um, it's a great show, uh, but it but it uh, it presents a different account. But it's also a, a reassuring account, if I yeah. I, I would say that that both countries, both both superpowers, and also their allies. You know, took seriously the, the responsibility of, of kind of nuclear stewardship, uh, if you will, and that even during a time when a lot of heated words were being exchanged, mm -hmm. uh, that they were able to disaggregate rhetoric and, and reality. Uh, and and that's, that's comforting, uh, you know, to me, uh, especially in our present moment. Yeah, yeah. And for uh, all of us scholars, young and old alike, it, this is a great case study in 
being open to new evidence, changing our mind and changing our assumptions. I like that you you said you had started the project as more of a, a believer in the conventional story that Abel Archer was this you know near nuclear crisis, the closest we came to you know, nuclear war since the Cuban Missile Crisis, and and then finding actually you know the evidence points points otherwise, and so let's be open to a reinterpretation there. So, and that um, uh, and again um, encourage anyone to uh, be submitting questions in the in the in the, in the chat room. Um, let me follow up with one, one more from me, which you alluded to, and we're now shifting a little bit more into historical method and, and archives. Um, uh, tell us more, of course it helps that you've got you know, some pretty remarkable linguistic gifts and know several languages. Tell us more about what was involved in digging around in historical archives in East Berlin and Prague to find out what was going on in Moscow and, and, and Washington. So. Yeah, well, I, I was I was uh, in in more ways than I could ever enumerate. Uh, extraordinarily fortunate, uh, and I know a great deal to my parents. But I was really lucky that that not only did they encourage me to a love of language, I was I was raised in a household where a lot of languages were spoken. Um, so I was able to tap a lot of uh, a lot of sources uh, for this work. I should preface my answer by saying that you know. What you can get right now in Moscow in the archives mm -hmm. would blow your mind. Mm -hmm. the, the quantity of material which has been re-declassified uh, by the current uh, regime in Russia, which is not one which we would think is, has a, a big kind of openness and transparency bent, yeah. uh, is, is pretty extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and these are materials which were open maybe in the very early 90s, uh, were closed off again by the Yeltsin administration and are now coming back uh, back out. So when I, when I say a lot of this, I, I don't want to give the impression that this is just uh, this is what you need to do in order to get anything out of out of Moscow. There's actually a ton there. Mm -hmm. But if you also pay a visit to Berlin, Prague, uh, I got some really wonderful material in Kiev, Ukraine, where everything uh, from the communist period has been completely declassified. And that's also true throughout the Eastern Bloc, mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, with the exception of some intelligence materials, not so much foreign intelligence materials. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like to talk about it as a backdoor, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so if the Warsaw Pact was, let's say, not uh, an, an equitable arrangement amongst uh, all of its members, uh, even if you want to exercise control over your, your partners, you need to tell them what to what to say, right? You need to explain things to them. And thus, a lot of really sensitive documents, which are not yet fully declassified in Russia, exist on the recipient end mm -hmm. uh, in Berlin, in Prague, because you know, this needed to be laid out, the line needed to be uh, laid out, and it was often hotly debated, for example, at the upper echelons of, of Warsaw Pact leadership at uh, the political consultative committee, and it was really hashed out. And you see some figures like Enver Hoxha of Albania, Nikola Ceausescu of, of Romania, you know, really fight back against, uh, against, against what the Soviets are saying. But through those archives, you can get an amazing picture into what is going on in Moscow. So I could, you know, and I could talk about this for a very long time, but I, I want to tell you just one example. Um, and you, you teed up the Abel Archer point. So uh, we have this kind of image of, of two administrations that are never talking, right? In, in the first half of the eighties in particular. And by, by really pure chance in the East German uh, Communist Party archives uh, in, in Berlin, uh, I came across a treasure trove of memoranda of conversation of secret back channel negotiations, which were taking place in Berlin between the US ambassador to West Germany, it was a guy called Arthur Burns, uh, and the Soviet ambassadors to East Germany. There's a couple during this, during this period, two very senior postings, uh, you know, this is the kind of diplomatic A team whom you're sending to those jobs, but also who have a pretext to meet because they're the, I think the official term is co allied military governors of Berlin. So they have a reason to meet. It doesn't incur any interest because usually when they meet, it's about, okay, well, we're supposed to only fly 17 aircraft through the corridor and we'd like to fly 18, please. Okay, stamp, move on. Burns, Reagan's appointee, sits down and he says, Ronald Reagan sent me here to use this as a means of keeping the Cold War under control 
uh, as a means of opening dialogue in a, in a kind of a, a very non-ideological manner. In fact, Burns says something truly extraordinary uh, in 1983, where he says uh, it, the, his Soviet interlocutor, Vyacheslav Kochimasov, is complaining, and Reagan keeps on saying these very unkind things about us. And Burns says, you must think about this in the context of a parent becoming irate and lashing out verbally at a child whom they love. That's not the conventional image of Ronald Reagan, yeah. <laughs> you know, loving father uh, yeah. to the Soviet Union. I mean, he was yeah. his kids. Yeah. Um, these exist only because the East Germans got copies. So the versions I found, they were translated from the Russian into the German. Uh, but they're a wonderful insight into a little known aspect of the totality of the Cold War, right? That really cuts against this grain of second Cold War confrontation clash, but actually shows how Reagan is really deftly using carrot and stick in order to achieve the results that he wants uh, from, for US policy towards the Soviet Union. So that's just a, a little uh, idea of, of what you can do. Um, there's a lot more to be said for, for, the, for the Eastern European archives, but I've, I've probably already said too much. No, uh, yeah, but although I, I hope that that whets the appetite again of uh, you know, some of the other graduate students and, and scholars on, on, the, on the call to, be, to realize just the almost you know, uh, infinite new findings available in, the, in, the, in, the, in those archives and why we really need you know, as many pieces as possible from as many vantage points to, to come as close as we can to the full picture. All right, I want to read a question here from one of our, our, our listeners, um, uh, uh, Kip D, 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 Eugenio, if I'm giving your right, uh, name right, Kip. First of all, shout out to Kip. Um, he bought the book on Amazon and has read it already. So uh, anyway, uh, bonus points there. And um, the question is this, um, that you identify 1983 as the year of extremes and kind of the height of the tensions. Uh, but wonders if 1982 was nearly as turbulent. You've got the Falklands War, you've got the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. I, I would also add, of course, that's the height of the pipeline sanctions dispute that really splits the U.S. from its allies. Um, so did you? here's the question. Did you and your research come across indications that the Soviets saw 1982 as a further example of the deterioration of American power and prestige? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kip. Not only for for, for buying the book, but for, for that great question. Mm -hmm. uh, I found that in 1982, uh, it's undeniable that the Soviets looked uh, at, for example, the invasion of of, of Lebanon mm -hmm. uh, and saw this as as just more trouble mm -hmm. for the 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 United States. And 1982 is uh, certainly uh, a rough year for Allied relations. Right. One other point I would add, and this is actually the one which I engage with on a mo the most sustained basis in this book, is the controversy over the deployment of American nuclear weapons to Western Europe. Yeah. Right. The so-called Euro missiles. Yeah. Uh, which was an extraordinary. Yeah. Yes, yeah, the Pershing twos and also ground-launched cruise missiles, the Griffins. Yeah. Um, this is an extraordinarily fraught issue in NATO. Uh, some of the biggest crowds in the history of some very big cities, uh, including, uh, you know, NATO capitals. Also in the United States, there are massive rallies in Canada and also around the world. There's also a big East German peace movement as well, which is part of this story. Um, that was actually the episode that I really focused on the most uh, as being emblematic of a real lack of unity. Uh, within the NATO alliance, mm -hmm. driven in part by fears about nuclear war at a time when rhetoric was 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 significantly heated up, mm -hmm. but also driven by perceptions of Ronald Reagan as this kind of nuclear cowboy, mm -hmm. um, and also perceptions, I have to say, of Margaret Thatcher as such, and she's a key partner of his in this process. So 82 is a really tough one for the United States for that reason. It's one that the Soviets really kind of probably look back on as the last really good year, in a sense, in their, you know, kind of contest with the United States, um, not because there are no issues there. And indeed, you know, this is the year that Landon Brezhnev dies, uh, but because the United States is having real trouble uh, getting this policy through. It needs national support in all of the basin countries. 
Some of them are much more reticent than others, uh, Italians, even the Germans, right? Uh, it doesn't become a settled issue until uh, November 1983 when the West German Bundestag votes to, 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 to accept the, the Pershing twos. Yeah. And of course, West Germany is especially important because they're the only NATO country taking the Pershing twos and the Griffins, right? The others were just yes. getting the Griffins, I think. Yeah. So. Yes. Yeah. And the Pershing two ballistic missile was perceived by a lot of people in the Soviet Union as being a decapitation weapon. Yeah. Um, and the Americans are trying to insist to the Soviets that uh, it's not able to strike Moscow, uh, which was true, but that was because of, of kind of some software uh, elements, not actually because of the innate capabilities of the weapon. And thus the Soviets, and again, I, you know, it's, it's very hard to blame them for this, say, well, why would we believe you that you've installed this software feature, which limits the capability of this weapon and prevents it from being a, a really useful uh, first strike uh, weapon? Though they had their fears about the, the cruise missile as well, which could evade uh, their anti-aircraft defenses. So they, they were, after 83, had a lot to worry about. Uh, but 82 is, is, a, is, a, is a more uh, sanguine year for them. Yeah. Well, and here's a follow-up question on, on 1982, which is another more notable and arguably positive development. And, you know, midway through the year is um, Al Haig resigns slash is fired, and then George Shultz becomes Secretary of State. Uh, we've talked about some other key figures in the book, Romico, Reagan, and Drop of Chinago. Tell us more about what you learned about George Shultz um, over the course of your, of your research and um, what kind of role he plays. So George Schultz looms large uh, in this product project um, because he really comes into uh, Foggy Bottom and is an enabler for Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, Haig's actual instincts were not really that contrary to Reagan's own, but there's kind of ideas and then there's implementation. Yeah. And, 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 and where, Al Haig, <laughs> where Al Haig really fell down was, was on the implementation yeah. front. You know, the Reagan team was never really a very strong foreign policy team. They think, OK, we'll bring Haig in, longtime Kissinger associate, Sackyer, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe in the past. He's going to give us some kind of foreign policy gravitas. Mm -hmm. um, and Haig takes that and runs with it. Mm -hmm. Schultz wants this to be Reagan's foreign policy. I think he really gets Reagan's kind of carrot and stick uh, approach. I think he gets it because he also comes from a sort of a business negotiation background. He was head of the Bechtel Corporation, which is yep. one of the biggest uh, construction, international construction firms. Um, and he's, he was also secretary of labor uh, under the, the Nixon administration. And, and during that time had significant dealings with, uh, with a lot of trade union. So Schultz- And then Secretary next, of Treasury too, yeah. So. And he was Secretary of the Treasury, yes. He had a long and distinguished uh, government career. Um, so Schultz, I think, intuitively understands Reagan's kind of carrot and stick approach uh, to dealing with the Soviets. He embraces it. Uh, he's a very, very strong proponent early on. Um, and unlike Haig, he doesn't try to kind of make it his own, yeah. right? Uh, Haig, whose uh, whose final re when his final resignation comes, you know, Reagan writes in his diary that the basic issue was whether the foreign policy of the Reagan administration would be decided by Ronald Reagan uh, or by Al Haig. Uh, yeah. It could not come to a, an agreement uh, yeah. on on that issue. Schultz doesn't do that. Um, Schultz not only kind of enables Reagan and kind of drives the Reagan dual track grand strategy in large part, uh, but he also is an extremely effective negotiator and interlocutor for the Soviets themselves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, his accession to power in the State Department is lauded uh, by Soviet foreign policy, sort of the Soviet foreign policy elite, uh, because they think he's going to be a much more Sympatico negotiator. He's a very hard negotiator, very, very hard nosed negotiator. But Schultz really, I think, is kind of one of the, the key figures in this book, uh, as you say, because he takes Reagan's ideas and really runs with them and implements them extraordinarily effectively in, uh, in foreign policy.
Yeah, no, I, I, I fully agree to put it, you know, interject a little bit of my own opinion in and, you know, something you and I've talked about. I really think that as far as kind of president, secretary of state tandems, um, Reagan and Schultz, you know, should be mentioned in the same breath as the more iconic ones like Truman Atchison, Nixon Kissinger, uh, Bush, Bush Baker, um, as far as a very close relationship um, between a and, you know, mutual regard between a president and secretary of state. Absolutely. And I think it also bears mentioning that George H.W. Bush, who is vice president at this point, is also a really important contributor to this. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's not just more there. This is one of the really underappreciated aspects of the Reagan administration is Vice President Bush and some of your. Yes. Friends. Yeah. Uh, someone who had, of course, extensive foreign policy experience as director of the CIA, as as the U.S. non-ambassador to the People's Republic of China. And indeed, Bush takes the the China file. to the UN, yeah, and, and of course, representatives of the UN. Bush takes the China file uh, in a large extent, and a, a significant improvement in U.S. Chinese relations during during this time. Yeah. Uh, but also on uh, the Soviet Union, Bush is a real ally of Schultz's, uh, of Jack Matlock's, who's in the NSC and whom, whom we're fortunate enough to count as a colleague here at Duke. Yeah. Um, who also kind of pioneer this, this approach to the Soviet Union, who's, uh, you know, in, in this case, I think the proof of the pudding is in the eating, which really pays major dividends. And Bush also plays the bureaucratic game really well. Uh, this is a, a seasoned political operator yeah. uh, who often, because he's in the West Wing, gives really valuable intelligence on the home front to, mm -hmm. for example, Schultz about you know, this is what's happening in the meeting after the meeting after the meeting mm -hmm. uh, so that so that Schultz knows, because this was still a hotly debated issue, knows what the lay of the land is in order to, to try to drive uh, the Reagan foreign policy, which I think he and Ronald Reagan really agreed on, but which some of Reagan's uh, staffers resisted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, as you uh, described very well in your book, um, another key intelligence collection function that Bush serves is he's the one who represents Reagan in the U.S. at three funerals in Moscow, you know, Brezhnev uh, and then Andropov and then Chernyenko. And of course, sends some really interesting cables back that he writes from Air Force Two, um, giving Reagan some first cuts on who the new leaders are going to be, what the mood is in the, in the Soviet Union. And the conversations at some of those meetings, you know, which are which are Bush and Schultz sitting down with uh, with the new Soviet leader and, and uh, foreign policy team are really revealing, yeah. are really revealing in, in the tenor, uh, which is quite at odds with a lot of the, the public rhetoric. In fact, when Bush and Andropov meet, uh, Andropov says something which is quite impactful, I think, where he says, you know, we're responsible people and we need to know the difference between the rhetoric that we say for political reasons mm -hmm. and the reality in which we need to find a way to coexist yeah. because mankind depends on this. He, uh, Andropov says, you know, we have the, the capacity uh, to do, do truly horrible damage. And this really takes Bush aback, mm -hmm. uh, who is not expecting to hear something like this from someone with a really sinister reputation, right? Andropov, yeah. KGB, he really, and he earned it, uh, you know, suppressing dissidents, uh, suppressing the Hungarian uprising in 1956, suppressing the Czechoslovak uprising in the Prague Spring in 1968. You know, he was a key voice uh, for, for that. And then here he is saying, you know, we have a responsibility to ourselves and our, to our, our citizens in order to not get carried away by the rhetoric. We need to be cold, calculating uh, superpowers. And they, they talk a lot the Soviets in particular use the use rhetoric a lot about kind of the res, the superpower responsibility mm. right, to the to the world. So so Bush gets the front row seat for this mm -hmm. also gets the front row seat for the, you know, seeing what Moscow looks like in the 1980s, yeah. which, uh, you know, he writes about it does not exactly inspire confidence in the in the Soviet system. Uh, Margaret Thatcher also writes some really great uh, sort of memos about about her experiences there. Um, so while the book is, you know, the book is very intentionally not called uh, Ronald Reagan, Mikhail Gorbachev, and the beginning of the end of the Cold War, uh, you know, it, it acknowledges uh, that these were team efforts mm -hmm. uh, on both sides. These were highly contingent events which could have gone uh, 
very much worse, you know, very quickly, but rather that a confluence of groups of policymakers steered this thing towards a, uh, a much better conclusion than we might easily imagine. Yeah. So, well, and the, let's one more question for me, and we're coming up on the witching hour here to, to, to wrap up. Um, but um, that's, that's a good segue for the final one to bring us up to the present day. This is a history book, got great insights on the 1980s. Um, anything you learned from your book or any takeaways uh, on what it might mean for the you know, troubled U.S.-Russia relationship today? Sure. This uh, was something which I was always curious about. Um, and if I can grossly oversimplify the way a lot of the story of the end of the Cold War is told, it's that the United States was strong, the Soviet Union was weak, ergo the United States basically did as it pleased after the Soviet Union became even weaker, that is to say, ceased to exist uh, in, in the form of Russia. Thus, what grounds did Moscow have to complain about this? This is the reality of international politics. Right. This is, you know, as Thucydides writes, uh, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Uh, you lost. That's the 85 to kind of 91 story of the end of the Cold War. The 80 to 91 story, the, f the first half of which is in this is, is in this book. It's a very different story. Ronald Reagan comes into office believing that the Soviet Union has pulled ahead of the United States. The a man who is kind of now the avatar of American optimism to a lot of people. If you read his campaign speeches, his inaugural, uh, his acceptance speech at the, the RNC in Detroit, very pessimistic about where the United States stands in the world. Yeah. That's just five extra years, right? That's still the same careers. That's the lived experience of people who are in Moscow making policy right now. Putin and his coterie. So this idea of kind of getting back to a position of strength in, in Moscow, and that's what I would argue is, is being is the driving motivator of Russian grand strategy today. That's not some kind of distant, imaginary, sort of fictionalized World War II hero narrative. Mm -hmm. That's their early careers. Yeah. And, and one man who has a front row seat to the, the really ugly side of this process is Vladimir Putin who's in East Germany for the breakup, uh, for, the, for, the, for the breaking down of the Berlin Wall, um, who actually at one point uh, you know, is, is in, in Dresden where he's, he's stationed uh, and he's surrounded by an angry mob trying to break into the little KGB uh, base to get documents. And he can't get support from the Soviet military forces uh, in East Germany. So, this experience, which I argue, you know, the trends that culminate in it are, 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 are established in the first half of the 1980s, is vividly remembered by people in Russia, uh, not just in leadership positions. Uh, and thus, what they're trying to regain uh, by being more assertive and more active internationally uh, is something which they had not that long ago. Yeah, yeah. Really good reminder of how we are all products of our history. So, yeah, I think this is the structure and agency point on which we started. Yeah. Uh, we've we've come full circle. Yeah, uh, different agents and a different structure. Yeah. So, well, once again, everyone, you've heard it from me a few times. But one final plug: here's the book "Engaging the Evil Empire" by Dr. Simon Miles, proud alum of the University of Texas at Austin, uh, now professor at Duke, Duke University. Um, so, uh, really enjoyed the discussion, Simon. Thank you for your time and, and your insights. Um, and uh, best wishes to all, all of our audience. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you. Well. Great. Okay. Great. Right.